everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today with the Barnes & Noble Book Club virtual event. My name is Allison Gavilet. I'm a publisher liaison here at Barnes & Noble. I'm here with Lexi Smith, Smith, the Fiction Category Manager, and of course, Rachel Kong, the author of our book club for this month, Real Americans. Um, I'm going to pass over to Lexi to kick us off. But before I do that, we do have an open chat. So if you have any questions, please drop them in there. I'll be looking out for those. And let's get to it. Thank you so much. Yeah, hi, everybody. So Rachel Kong is the author of Goodbye Vitamin, which won the 2017 California Book Award for First Fiction and the LA Times Book Prize finalist for First Fiction. She was the managing and executive editor of Lucky Peach Magazine from 2011 to 2016, and she is the founder of The Ruby, an event space for women and non-binary non writers and artists in San Francisco. Her most recent novel is Real Americans, which just happens to be our May book club pick. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. And Lexi and Allison, thank you for being my conversation partners. I'm so excited. We are very happy to be here talking with you. Um, okay, so let's let's kick it off. Um, I, the first question I have for you. So this is a story that spans continents, generations, and narrators. Did you know that that was how you were going to tell this story when you first sat down to write it? I think initially, no, um, because that would have been too daunting. It would have been such a big project. I mean, had I known um, all the things that were to come, I probably would have uh, panicked and, and never began writing this story. For me, it actually started with the character of Lily, and I started writing in the perspective of Lily, um, thinking that maybe I was writing a short story or something, you know, thinking that I was writing something uh, much more slight. But I think that as I wrote her character, um, more and more questions accumulated and more of these themes accumulated. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I don't know, these other characters just emerged actually. After I wrote Lily, I wrote Nick's character and then May's. And they all seemed to be in dialogue with one another, um, and they all seemed um, so necessary to the book. I think after, um, yeah, once that became clear, I was like, okay, this is like a much larger project and um, will require <laughs> much more of me. Yeah. So you just um, actually got to my next question, but you started with Lily, um, and then you said that they kind of all kind of got the next one. So how did yeah. that impact the other uh, the other perspectives? How did um, each of the characters impact yeah. the other ones? Yeah, and starting with Lily's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that was just such an interesting question to me. You know, what does one character know that another character might not know? You know what I mean? I was really interested in this question of like, what are the things that we just don't have access to, you know, because we're just one person, right? And we are, we have our perspectives. Um, we're formed um, from very specific circumstances. We're raised in specific ways. And that really shapes the way that we look at the world, the way that we view other people, sometimes judge other people, right? And so with each of the characters, I think that they themselves are so um of course like shaped by the nation that they were you know that they they live in but shaped by culture all of these things um and so they struggle to understand the other people in their lives i mean you know despite trying i think they often um don't fully understand where you know say their mother or um daughter is coming from and so that was really interesting to me just the ways in which um i don't know we can try so hard to understand the people that we love the most um, and still fall short of that because their realities are just so different from our own. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's sort of where the three characters, I think hopefully um, really embody that and show you that, right? Like as you're reading one character's perspective, you think, okay, like I'm with this person in particular. And then you shift to another character's perspective and you're like, okay, I understand a little bit more. <laughs> where you know this person might be coming from or i might see or i might see from this character's perspective and wonder why this first character was the way they were you know what i mean like it's just like sort of uh, complicating the picture a little bit and i love that you know i love um just like getting getting more complicated 
Um, this question, this next question actually came from one of the attendees on here. And the question is, was there ever a point in the writing process where the order of the three point of views would have been different? I love this question because I think you can easily imagine it um, in a more chronological, you know, telling. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. It would have made a lot of sense for May to come first and then Lily and then Nick. Um, but for some reason, I always had it in this particular order. Um, I think because I wanted it to be sort of like more immediately accessible. Not that, you know, not that May's part isn't accessible, but I think that it does read a little bit almost like historical fiction, right? It's sort of pulling you back into the past. It's explaining things that happened um, decades ago. And so I really wanted to start with this perspective that was um, in a lot of our recent memories, not everybody's, but, you know, the sort of 1999 Y2K era, um, a lot of us lived through that and uh, and are also living through this time now. And so I think that felt to me like an, a sort of, I don't want to say easier, but it was just like an entry point that I understood um, and, and felt like, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to start there because it was almost like this like more accessible entry point. And then from there, you sort of get deeper into the story and then deeper into the story. And, um, and so it was always this way for me just be these three characters I definitely didn't know everything that was going to happen in the novel itself I sort of just knew that these perspectives were um showing up when they did and like in the eras that they're sort of um part of you know I always kind of knew Y2K and then 2021 and then 2030 and it's funny because I I started writing the 2021 section before the pandemic, actually. Um, I knew Nick's character. I knew he was in 2021. And then when the pandemic started, I thought, maybe this will just blow over and I don't have to talk about it at all. <laughs> and oh, the naivety of us back then. <laughs> I know. We thought, oh, maybe it'll last a month or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, of course, had to write much more into that because in a way that's his, you know, each of these characters also lives through these great sort of um, national tragedies right um and and i didn't realize that that was what nix was until i had to live through it myself right and and experience that did you have one that was your favorite favorite character mm -hmm. i know i yeah i actually um it's funny because i think that if i chose a favorite um the reader would be able to feel it you know and the reader would be able to um yeah would would know it and i think Part of the interest and challenge to me was um, wanting to write three separate characters who you felt deeply for. I think my tendency when I'm a reader is that I get attached to the first character and you really want to stick with the first character because it's almost like the person that you got to know, you know, first and best. Um, and so that was really my challenge. I really wanted readers to not just be attached to Lily, but to sort of um, very quickly, um, yeah, like get into the perspectives of these other characters as well. So something that struck both me and Allison about this book is just how much research you must have done for it from, you know, May's youth in Beijing and what that was like to like the actual science portions of the book. Can you talk to us about how you gathered all of that information, how long it took you, how you incorporated it into the book? Because it is just fascinating to me. Yeah, I I did do a lot of research for this book. I also did a lot of um I, I don't know, it's hard to say what exactly was research, you know, with a capital R, because I think that writing is so much about just sort of collecting things and observing things. You're observing things about your environment, but you're also reading, right? You're reading other novels, but also reading nonfiction. Um, and for me, I think the the like reading and being in the world part is so intertwined with writing itself, right? So a lot of the like quote unquote research that I did was, it was really just like reading books, right? Reading books or watching um, oral histories or whatever it was, but sort of internalizing all of this information and really like metabolizing it for myself, right? And I think 
um, that the all the reading that I did informed the book itself, right? And sort of shaped the book itself. It's not that I had this idea and then I had to, you know, do all this research in order to support that idea. It was more that I had a vague sense of where I was going. And then the the research really, um, really shaped, you know, shaped the book itself. You know, I learned about what was possible in gene editing in the 70s, for example, or I learned about what was possible in gene editing now and um, and sort of like, you know, built plot points and things around that. Um, and I think being a writer is so much about just following your curiosity, right? And following, um, yeah, just what you find interesting. Um, and so science is one of those things that as a kid, I was sort of told that I was bad at it. and I. You know, I was like, I didn't get good grades in science. I um, I found it interesting, but I also found it so daunting. And I think in school, especially, you're sort of divided into these categories, right? Like you're either like an arts, an artsy literature person or you're a sciencey math person. And I was definitely, you know, the former. I wasn't someone who was good at math or science. But I think as an adult, as a writer, I get to just be interested in what I'm interested in, right? And the the more daunting it is, the better, actually, right? Like I get to um, just pursue these things, even though um, maybe I, I I was told at a previous point in life that I that I sh you know shouldn't because it wasn't um, what I was like quote unquote good at. So um, yeah. One of the things that really hooked me from the start about this book is that while it is very grounded in science and reality, it also contains these little elements of things that feel like almost fairy tale like magic to me, like May's yard full of four leaf clovers or the way the characters can pause time, the early days of Matthew and Lily's relationship. Did you intend to have both of these elements in the novel, sort of the the hard science and the fantastical? And if you did, how did you balance the two? Yes, I think it's not something that I consciously knew going into writing this book, but I think it's something that emerged from writing this book and something that I sort of came to. I knew that the book was always about science and that there are these geneticist characters. Um, but I think the sort of magical elements um, emerged a little bit later and they made made a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, so for one example is the time stoppages. Um, I had been writing those scenes into the book, but I didn't understand what was going on. And I kept trying to read um, scientific papers about like circadian rhythms and all of these scientific explanations for what was happening. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't make it work. And at some point, I think years into it, I thought, oh, what if it's magic? And and I thought immediately, oh no, this is not, it's not good because this is a book about science. I can't have magic in it. Um, but the more that I sat with it, the more that it made so much sense to me. I mean, I knew that, um, you know, I, I think that science is so much about, um, I mean, our impression of science now, right, is that it's so much about um, logic and being rational and, um, you know, like, observing things in the world empirically and then understanding the world better. There's a sense that like we can really know everything if we understand science fully. Um, but I think even scientists know that that's not true, right? There are so many mysteries to the world that we are not even close to understanding. And it's a beautiful pursuit to try to understand, but also there's this element of humility. Like we have to know that we're, you know, we are limited and we don't understand everything. Um, and I think that I wanted to yeah, sort of counter that um, uh, that that belief that we have in our own sort of supremacy and like understanding of things. Um, and at the same time, there is an element of science and just like the world, right? And being alive that it that does strike me as magical, right? Like, um, like the fact that like flowers bloom in the spring and they're so amazing. Like every single flower is so amazing. You know what I mean? Like there's like such an intricacy to um, these really basic scientific processes, right? Like the fact that like we're encoded by D DNA and um, you know, that a flower blooms according to these instructions. Like I know that there's a scientific explanation to it, but it does also seem like a miracle, right? And the fact that we're here is like so 
you can understand it in the scientific way. Like, okay, there was like, you know, an embryo, like these things happen, like cells dividing, stuff like that. You can understand it on the scientific level. Um, but it's also just a miracle, right? That like we here, we are here specifically. So I think that 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 interplay is so fascinating to me and one that I really wanted to sort of draw out because it's so easy to just, um, yeah, want to make, want to make a story about one or the other. And, and I was more interested in the ways in which they're sort of in conversation with each other, right? Science and magic. Yeah. I love that. Um, I love the way that you write about class and money also. Um, a line that stuck with me was when Matthew buys Lily the dress and she thought mm -hmm. it was perfect. The sort of dress I wish I knew how to buy for myself. Can you talk a bit about the role that class and money play in the novel and how they impact the way the characters interact with the world around them? Yeah. I mean, I think that class is one of those things that, um, especially in America, we don't like to talk about or or even acknowledge exists, even though it so clearly does, because there's just so much inequality in this country in particular. And I think um, it's, yeah, I think that I couldn't really write about, um, you know, Americanness and American culture and what it means to be an American without writing about class as well and without writing about money. I mean, I think that's something that I was really interested in um, is this, the, the sort of way that, um, the narratives of like wealth and class intersect with the narratives of, um, sort of individual success and striving. So like, I think, especially in this country, um, there's this belief that we create our futures, right. And we, um, are individually responsible for our outcomes in life. And so, um, that's, it's something, and and it's the reason that sort of, you know, like there's so much aspiration to, right? It's like, oh, if I just work hard enough, if I do do X, Y, or Z, then I can maybe achieve these levels of wealth and um, and and fortune um, that I see others in this country having. But I think that the reality is often that, um, you know, the the really powerful, the really wealthy, have come to this place of power and wealth through. Um, some kind of like family, you know, family wealth. It's it's a situation they were born into, or maybe it's a situation in which, um, yeah, they sort of made this wealth through hard work, but it was also through like you know through some measure of exploitation, right, and other people, right. Um, and so I think we want to believe in this myth of like individual success and like sort of you know the bootstrap story, right, and like, like being successful on our own. Um, but I think the reality is that it's much more complicated and it's often the wealthiest, most powerful people who um, have come from, you know, these like networks, right? And come from um, wealth themselves. And so I think uh, um, I, I really wanted to just write that and how, um, you know, Lily comes from a family that, you know, real at least, especially with her mother, her mother really has to believe in this American dream, right? Because she's coming from um, a pretty hard situation and um, she wants to make something of herself. She has all these aspirations, these dreams. Um, but the reality is so much more difficult than, you know, sort of what is advertised, um, what is um, promised to her. And um, I really wanted to show those two, you know, characters with their families, like in this juxtaposition right like we see see the ways in which the Meyer family really doesn't have to um even be aware of a lot that the that the Chen family has to be aware of right I think when Lily is sort of um you mentioned um that scene in particular I mean she has to do a lot of adjusting to Matthew's world right and he never seems to be able to adjust to hers and so I think um she is a character you know with whom we can um yeah, I don't know, just like sort of get into and observe the differences, right? And observe the ways in which, um, yeah, these, like there's so many class differences, um, but they're sort of, I don't know, they're sort of brushed under this rug of 
um, of, you know, like what America wants to believe about itself. That's so true. Um, did you write this novel while listening to the music that Lily and Matthew connected through? <laughs> I wrote this novel actually um, along to a lot of instrumental music um, oh. because yeah, it's hard to listen to to pop music. I think when I'm when I'm writing, um, but uh, one album that got a lot of heavy rotation was the thread, the the soundtrack, um, the Phantom Thread, the movie. Uh -huh. It's this beautiful like Johnny Greenwood album, um, lots of strings and stuff. And I would just loop that album over and over again. That's so funny. I can I only can listen to instrumental music when I'm at work too. Like other people have all yeah. of these uh other all this kind of music playing and I'm like, no, instrumental. I can't concentrate otherwise. Yeah. I would start typing out the words that are in the song, you know? I'll do the same thing or yeah. I'll start singing and I'm like, what am I working on? <laughs> um well I, I think you know this, but if you don't, we have um a sign topper in our stores in some stores that have a QR code that links to the playlist yes. from the book. I love that. <laughs> so I have yes. to ask about yeah. it. It was funny. Yeah, I was asked to make the playlist. There's a playlist that Lily gives to Matthew and um, I was asked to like put together any playlist. And I thought, oh, I'll just like make the playlist that Lily gives to Matthew. But it was actually so strange to imagine the characters like living in the same universe as us, you know, sure. and like having the same music. I don't know. It's so interesting to to like sort of, yeah, believe that they're real, but then also believe that they're in in our world. <laughs> Um, okay, so I really want to talk about Lily and May because that is one of the like most interesting relationships in the book to me. Um, I'm wondering just like to start, like how did you write that relationship? It, there's so much love there, but it's so complicated. So if you can tell us a little more about that, I would love to hear about it. Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely... Yeah, I think, I don't know. I At least for myself, I feel like um, parent child relationships have always been, um, really interesting to me. You know, I sort of mentioned the ways in which we're so limited in our perspectives. And I think the parent child relationship is so fascinating to me. It's something that I wrote about in my first novel too. You know, I think the fact that, um, you know, your, your parent has lived a whole life separate from you before you came along, um, is so, fascinating and it's something that you as a child don't have access to I mean you can try to ask about it but it's not really the same as actually being their peer right you can never be their peer it's always this like kind of sort of strange relationship where like one person started earlier than the other person and you were in this sort of um yeah maybe you lived together but there's still there's still sort of these disconnects in communication. I knew that, you know, I, I think complicated families are always so interesting to me in writing, especially in reading. Um, you know, there's the the quote obviously about like the un unhappy families being unhappy in their own way. Um, and I think that um I just, yeah, with May and Lily specifically, I knew that I wanted them to have these different styles of um sort of communicating love and expressing love um and having those styles just kind of miss each other even though we know that each of them does love the other person um it's it's so complicated like how they're able to express it to each other um and i think it's something that i definitely you know take from my own life a little bit i mean i'm definitely not you know, it's definitely not like me and my mom or Lily and May at all. Um, and there are these huge differences, but I think that the the similarity is in this, um, yeah, just like the fact that, I don't know, love language is almost like a too basic term or something for it because it's, it's something that gets so complicated by, um, by, by culture also, right. It's, it's, it's that, um, you know, it's that May was just raised in a, a completely different culture, um, had to live a much more difficult life. And as a result, she has different priorities, right? And she has um, she has real hopes for, for Lily, um, but that's not what Lily needs because she's her own person. She was raised in her own culture, her own 
um, sort of like just like soup of experience, right? And so, um, and so they're always going to miss each other in that way. And I think that that's, it's, it's, it's of course like kind of sad, you know, that we can't be perfectly aligned all the time. But I think that there is something beautiful in the sort of effort to try to meet each other where we are and to sort of like have those moments of connection. Um, I think these characters often miss each other and um, yeah, don't quite communicate in the way that they they maybe should in order to like fully connect. But they also do have these real moments of connection and hope, I hope. So um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to that relationship. We could probably have a whole whole conversation about it. No, I mean, you you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to ask you after this question. Um, there was a, just a moment in the book that really struck me as, about how, as you said, Lily and May really miss each other. After Lily has Nick, you know, she tears up when Otto is visiting and ask, asks her how she's feeling and notes mm -hmm. that her mother had never asked her that question, but instead like came and immediately jumped into action. And I thought it was just like, such a perfect moment of these people like love each other so much and they just like they're not seeing yeah. eye to eye they're they're missing each other the love is there but they can't really experience it and I just I thought it was so true to life so um, I'm really happy to hear you talk about that yeah thank you yeah I feel like with Otto um you know he he is basically speaking in this language that Lily does appreciate right she does want to she just she wants to be asked how she is and that's something that isn't really second nature to May right she just she wants to do something and I think that they do have that moment of like respite and connection right I think I think I feel like a, a great relief for Lily when it's just Lily and May and um you know and and they're just in the in the house with the babies you know what I mean like there's there's a moment of 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 like sort of just like pure love and like presence for them yeah that is sort of uncomplicated by by everything else um, another question I had sort of turning to a different part of the book, um, you know, while Lily leaves Matthew over Otto and May's betrayal with their genetic experimentation on Nick, do you think if she stayed, she would have ever been able to fully embrace the Myers lifestyle? Like, would she have found a way to fit in or would she always feel sort of the strangeness that she was experiencing? Yeah. I think, I don't know. I think of Lily as somebody who who would eventually have to find her own way right and 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 sort of figure out how to be true to herself in whatever way that meant I mean I think that's such an interesting question because this book is so much about these sort of like moments right that change everything right and and her leaving Matthew is one of those huge decisions that changes everything and I think that for most of our lives right there are these moments where it's it's almost like it things feel faded or things feel like, oh, I had to make this decision or I had to fall in love with this person or I had to leave this place, you know, and, and it's a mix of like making a decision, but also like a thing that had to happen in order for your life to, I don't know, to, to, to be what it is. Um, and, and so for Lily, I mean, I think it's interesting because I can also see, yeah, I mean, plenty of people, right. You sort of start living a life that isn't quite fully yours and you just do it, you know, year after year because you have to, or it's, you know, being with Matthew made Lily's life so much easier, right? It just made the material sort of concerns disappear. She could sort of, um, she could, in some ways, like she could be, you know, she had the luxury of finding out who she wanted to be because these material concerns were taken care of. But at the same time, I just don't think that that's who she, who she really ultimately is, right? And I think maybe she would have had like a midlife crisis <laughs> at like, you know, 47 and and then she would have left him then. But you know what I mean? Like, I think that there's, there's some, there's something that just like never was going to work, I think, because of, because she didn't want to adapt so fully to him, right? Like there had to be more of this like meeting of the, or like, you know, like him sort of, like, I, I think if he had conformed more to her, her lifestyle, there could be some um, future there, but I think because it was so much about her 
changing herself to fit in with that life that that eventually at some point in this this other universe she would have left too <laughs> yeah speaking of um Otto and May's betrayal why didn't Matthew also leave like he was betrayed too yeah and then why does Lily choose to keep Nick from knowing Matthew and the Myers yeah I think that this is something you know so Matthew it's sort of discussed in the final section that he um you know despite what he presented himself as you know I think initially when Lily meets him he's under a he's using a different last name he doesn't really want to be associated with his family's wealth at the same time he's never known anything else and he lives such a comfortable life um as the member of this incredibly wealthy family and so I think that for him ultimately it is about not being able to imagine this other way of life like a way of life that's completely cut off from his family that has given him so much um and even though he wants to believe that he would be um his own person he he hasn't really figured out a way to be his own person I think maybe until the very end he gets like some glimmer of that um but yeah okay what was the other question it was uh why did Lily keep Nick from knowing them yes I mean I think that Lily again it's like one of those things where you know parents are making decisions for their children that they think are best sort of based on their limited understanding of what they believe is best you know I think that's the best case scenario is that your your parents are doing the the best they possibly can for you. And so for, for Lily and Nick, it's, she thinks, oh, it's better if he just doesn't, I don't know if he just doesn't know this other half, because like I can raise him in a better way. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I can do better than this other option. And I think that she, she just thinks that what they have done is so unforgivable. Um, maybe she also thinks that it would be so tempting for him to obviously like gravity. It's so like wealth is so alluring. Right. And it's so um, it's it almost goes unquestioned. Right. It's like, of course, you would just take the money. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think she thinks she believes that she's protecting him. It's in the same way that she forbids him from using, you know, these technological devices like and just like being a regular a quote unquote regular teenager or like the other kids I think she thinks oh I know I know better you know I know best for my son and I know that um that these things are really harmful like wealth is really harmful and technology is really harmful so of course I would I would banish him from these things and yet that of course backfires because he becomes so curious about both and um and i think i just wanted to explore that tangle right like even though you might i don't know just you really want the best for your children um they're just living in a completely different you know era context everything and you can't completely control their outcomes either right and so um yeah so i think lily is it's just like a classic case of trying your best or believing that you know best for your child and then uh, yeah and then and and messing it up in the process um i want to talk a little bit more about lily and nick um so lily wants to give oh sorry excuse me you just answered that question i apologize no, no. <laughs> so sorry um i thought it was fascinating that nick cuts lily off after she confronts him about um knowing matthew but when Matthew tells Nick about why Lily will about why Lily chose to leave and why Matthew stayed, he continues to pursue a relationship with Matthew. I'd love to know more about why you chose to write the situation that way. Um, just like that, that Nick hides it from her or. Yeah, that he's hiding it from her. Yeah. I mean, I think it's that Nick feels it's it's just this like you know perpetuating of like what you have been you know raised with and taught yourself right like i think that he um it becomes this almost it's a it's a way for him to feel like he has power over his 
mother in a way that he never has had before. You know, it's almost this like, you know, as a child, he has been raised so, you know, strictly under her own, you know, under her um, guardianship and, and he just, yeah, he just, he just really wants to rebel, right? Like he just wants to sort of wield this power over his mother that he has never had before. And he's almost just like testing it out. Um, I think he's, he's really resentful of the fact that she, um, yeah, was so controlling over his life for so long, or at least that's how he views it. Like she views it as protection, but he views it as a sort of suffocation and, um, a sort of, yeah, just this, this, you know, this, this horrible, almost like a prison or something, right? Like he, he views it as this like terrible thing that has been done to him. Um, and at the same time, he feels, he also, you know, he loves his mother deeply. I think they both, again, it's this relationship where they love each other so deeply, but, um, but they're just missing each other again. And, and he feels almost like suffocated by, by the love that she has for him. So I think that he he's also doing like a sort of self-protective thing or not self-protective, but like a, a thing that is protective of her in the same way that she has tried to protect him and put all these rules on his life in order to protect him. Um, he is, he's like in exchange trying to protect her. And so I think that's something that I was so interested in is the ways that even when things are done to us that we wish were otherwise, and, you know, we wish our parents had done something else, um, we sort of do a version of it. You know, we, we, we continue the sort of cycle and the lineage, even sometimes like unbeknownst to ourselves. Yeah. So there was a moment that was um, shocking, but also not surprising to me at the same time in the book, which is how indifferent what that Matthew was to Samuel's suicide attempt. Can you talk a little bit about like what it was like to write that moment where, how, how you got there, what you think was going on for Matthew in that moment? Um, his sort of like lack of compassion at the very end. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, a lot of Matthew's sort of development happen, you know, like, or his, his character is happening off, you know, off the page. It's not really something that we're um, viewing in the story itself because that wasn't really um, my interest in particular. I was interested in these, these three characters of, of the Chen family. And so for Matthew, I think that he is, um, you know, he has lived a whole life sort of off the page that we haven't seen. And part of that life is that he is remarried. He has had this son. And um, and I think that like while he is living this other life, he is still imagining what could have been, right? Like what his life could have been like if he had stayed with Lily, if he had raised Nick, you know, if they had been a family. And I think um, that despite the way that he was raised and raised under a lot of pressure to be a certain way, to be the sort of, um, you know, to continue the lineage of this powerful pharmaceuticals family, um, despite, despite the pressures that he's felt in his own life, um, he, he still, he still wants, he kind of wants that for himself, right. To have a son who is like, um, in his image, right. And who sort of, um, cares about the things he cares about and, and, you know, and, and that he feels, um, really connected to and in a relationship with, I mean, I think that Matthew, it's a, it's a thing that's so common to, to, um, parents, I think, is this hope that, um, you'll just really have, you know, a deep connection with your children, right. And you'll really understand them and you'll really, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know a little bit like, you know, be able to like live the life that you didn't get to through them. Right. At least I think for some, for some people that's, there's like the allure of that in, in becoming a parent, right? Like it's like, I never got, got to go to the major leagues. And so maybe my son, like little Timmy will or whatever. And I think like Matthew sort of has that feeling and, and does feel a little bit of disappointment in Sam for not being, for not, um sort of like quote unquote using his wealth right to 
for the good. And so I think that it is just like, we're sort of catching him in this, this moment of um, like disappointment, frustration, whatever it is. Um, and it's sort of this like confluence of, um, yeah, like regrets almost, right? Like, I think that he's feeling pity for himself, but he's also feeling disappointment. He's all, he's feeling so many things and he's feeling, um, I, I think he's definitely feeling like the regret of like, what if I had just like chosen this other life completely? You know, what if things had gone another way? And I don't think it makes him a terrible person. You know, I think in that moment, he is a terrible person, but I think each of these characters, you know, acts in ways that are really reprehensible, you know, at various moments of their lives, right? Um, but that doesn't de define who they are. Um, it's it's just these moments. And then, you know, hopefully they they sort of grow from those moments. Okay, so spoiler alert. Um, one thing I have to know, the lotus seed that May swallowed, did it affect her genes? Is the ability to slow time now a genetic trait in their family? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think that the magic sort of, you know, the magic made that change or whatever. And that is why it's it's being passed down. But yeah, I think it is. I think it's sort of left to the reader to decide. But but to me, that's what it was what it was doing. I love that. Love that so much. Um, I know we're getting close to time, so I'm going to ask I'm going to skip down our list of questions a little bit. Um, at the end of the book, May talks about how she's letting much of her life slip by because she had not paid attention to it. And that instead of seeking more time, she could have been paying attention. Time is such an important motif in the book. Everyone, rich or poor, um, is hoping for more of it. Was it your intention to have it be such a democratizing factor? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that the uh, there's a sort of like a, a thread in this book about, um, you know, time being the one thing that the wealthy can't buy. I mean, I think that they can you know, the powerful and the wealthy can sort of arrange their lives in such a way that, um, you know, they're, they're less pressed for time perhaps. Um, but in the end, we sort of have what we have and we have, um, the, the, the present most often. I mean, I think that I was very much interested in writing about, um, I don't know, like sort of American beliefs about time. And I, I think that there's such a belief in the promise of the future, right? And and also, I think um, a tendency to want to ignore the past, right? Just to pretend that the past didn't even happen. Um, and we are such a future-oriented culture, you know, in that, um, yeah, we. I, I think there's just like that is part of the 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 dream, right? That like things could be better in the future, um, and that. Um, the future holds all of this promise, but I think that sort of leads us to miss what's right in front of us and miss the present moments and and miss the sort of um, I don't know just the the richness of every every moment that we're living through. And I think um, May is a character, especially for whom she you know she's living so much in the future. Um, so much so that she yeah, doesn't want to talk about her past. She won't talk about her past until the sort of very, very end of her life. Um, but she she doesn't really realize it until the very end that that I don't know, that it's it's almost kind of it's almost a way to time travel, right? Like to just like exist in the present and to like fully experience the present moment. Like there is like this expansiveness there and there's a, a richness there and it doesn't always have to be about, about um yeah change or growth or whatever it is all right so we're running low on time um so i have two more questions i think rachel may have frozen though are you there rachel are you there rachel I'm there. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna ask yeah. you two more questions and then we're gonna okay. wrap things up. Um, okay. So one of the big things, themes that we've discussed in the book is people loving each other, but getting it wrong. And the ending seemed really hopeful. Um, you know, Lily comes to see May as she's ill 
And so I'm curious, like, do you think people are able to bridge that gap of loving each other, but getting it wrong? Yes. I mean, I think that we have to, because we're always going to get it wrong, you know, and we're always going to harm the people that we love the most. Um, But I think, I don't know, this book is just so much about recognize recognizing the ways in which we are wrong ourselves but also the ways in which we just can't fully understand um the ones we love the most and so sort of offering one another more compassion um and maybe not rushing directly into judgment um i think it's just so easy to judge judge other people because they haven't lived exactly the same lives that we have right and um and i think yeah, I mean, I think there has to be that that possibility, these like moments and um, the possibility of connection for sure. Finally, what do you want people to know about your book? Um, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's sort of what I, I just said. I think every book that I write is, um, it is a little bit of this like admonishment to myself to to be present and to exist in the present moment. And, um, and also, to remember that I don't, you know, a book is a a question. It's many questions. It's not me saying, here's, here are all the answers. It's more of an exploration of the questions. And the hope is that the reader will come to it and, um, and, and co-create the book with me. Right. And like ask their own questions. I mean, ask some of the ones that I have posed, but also ask them about their own lives and sort of create this whole separate, um, this whole book with me, right? It's, it's, it's not just that I wrote a book and then you're sort of passively consuming it. You are like co-creating this world with me and you're asking your own questions and you're bringing the questions to your own life. And I I think, um, you know, the takeaway, if there is one is it does have something to do with compassion. Right. And, and remembering that like each, each of us has lived lives and has, you know, emotional lives, has concerns, has all of these things that, um, that we really aren't privy to, um, that we can try to understand and we can make attempts toward understanding. We can ask one another, you know, about our stories. We can try try our best to understand one another's lives. And I think that's that's what fiction does. That's what, you know, community does. I mean, book, book clubs like these, right? Just like talking to other people and being in community with other people. Um, that is sort of how we, yeah, bridge those, you know, those divides in our consciousnesses, right? And and those divides in in who we are as people. And so, yeah, I think it's 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 about compassion, um, some humility maybe. And um yeah, and I, I think um I I think that's it, probably. That is really wonderful. Um that's about all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. And Rachel Thank you so much for writing such a wonderful book and for such a great conversation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. As a reminder, we're going to be back on July 2nd for our next book club virtual event, and we're looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you all again and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.